if you've got your handout with you, go ahead and get it out. We're making our way through the uh, book of First Thessalonians. We're not far from the end, although some preachers stretch things out. I, I hate it when they do that. You know, they just make us, you know. But we're talking about being flexible, being adaptive in our flourishing, that actually the best part of our ministry with each other comes when we tailor make it to each individual. And that's what this part passes. We're just going to deal, you'll love this, with one single verse. Is that okay? Chapter 5, verse 14. In fact, by the time you're done today, you may well have this verse memorized. Because we're just going to take it chunk by chunk and work our way through it in four different sections. Now, if I were to ask you a question today, actually, if I just said, give me an answer, if I just said, Ryan, give me an answer, you'd go, an answer for what? Terry, what's an answer? Yes. yes okay. So <laughs> you've got to be careful. So I can't, I can't have your house and, and car? <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's too, you're too easy. You're too easy. But if I'm going to ask a question, you'd know you could, could answer. But if I just said, give me an answer, you go, that's not possible because you got to know the context. You got to know the background. You got to know the question before the answer makes any sense. And that's kind of what we're talking about today is that one size does not fit all. Okay? When my daughter, who just turned 40, was born, some friends of ours said, well, Lydia, you're going to be home watching Bethany. Why don't you watch our baby or two? And Lydia said, well, okay, I guess I could. And that was the birth of our daycare. That was the birth of our child. So we've been doing this for 40 years. <laughs> That's what we say. Now, she's had a year or two off here having some surgeries and things, but every time she goes back to what she loves... In fact, I think a couple weeks ago, I was talking about work, and I said how my son always accuses me of never working because I love my job so much. He says, you know, you'll never work a day in your life if you love what you do. Lydia's the same way. Lydia's like, all the kids say, mom and dad have never had jobs because they love what they do so much, you know? But now when you're dealing with kids, when you're dealing with children, hi, honey, I'm talking about you there, Lydia. I'm talking about you. I thought I could get it out before she came back in here. But. <laughs> um, when you're working with kids, you deal with them on an individual basis. Each, each child has a way of growing up. In fact, the Bible says, train up a child in the way they should go. And the, the background of that is the way they're already kind of bent, the way they're kind of leaning is kind of the background for that. And each child has their own way. I mean, you remember this, some of you that are parents or now that you're grandparents, you know, some of your kids, just a look and they melt and you don't have to do any physical discipline. We didn't have any like that <laughs> of our kids. Uh, some kids, they, you need a firm rod of discipline, if you know what I mean, you know? What a spectrum, what a differentiation. And you got several kids. I mean, you got several kids, right? And they're all going to be slightly different. If you treat them all the same, what happens? You'll break one's spirit. You'll crush one's heart. And maybe you'll leave one abandoned. Okay? Because you want to make e one size does not fit all. I mean, think about it from a doctor's standpoint. If you walked into a doctor's office and he didn't even see you, he just threw some prescription through the door, you'd be going, once, no, that doesn't work. My brother-in-law had a doctor, he called him Dr. Pills. It was bad. He'd had a motorcycle accident and he had a lot of pain. And so this doctor just kept giving him pills. It eventually took his life. He's gone now. Yeah. You go, what? Well, you can't prosecute a doctor, but he was irresponsible because I don't think he took enough time to deal with it on a regular basis. And there was lots of doctors at the same time doing the same thing, okay? But one size does not fit 
all. The same thing is true for you and me in the body of Christ. We're called on to analyze and prescribe and then treat our love for one another differently. We treat each brother and sister in the family, in the body, on an individual basis, on a particular basis. I mean, that's what this passage is getting at. That's why we're going to see a breakdown of four different categories of people. These are broad categories, but probably all of us and every eye you connect with today, every person you lock eyes with today, will fit in one of these categories. <laughs> in fact, the last category <laughs> is a catch-all, not a one-size-fits-all, but it's something that does apply to everyone. So here's the verse. Here's the verse. It's 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. We urge you, brothers and sisters, notice that's not for just the pastor or the elders. Who's it for? Brothers and sisters. If you consider yourself a brother or a sister, this verse is for you. Okay? I urge you, the Apostle Paul, saying this to the church family at Thessalonica, I urge you, brothers and sisters, warn. Oh, you have to use that word? What if I don't like to warn? Someone's laying on the railroad tracks, the train's coming, you better warn them. Or you're negligent. Or you're culpable. You're irresponsible. There's a lot of people laying on a spiritual railroad track <laughs> with the evil one coming down the line, and you got to warn them, get out of there, run, get, a, get away, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Notice it's I-D-L-E, not I-D-O-L. <laughs> no, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Should we just tear this down? Let's just take that first section and talk about warning the idle. Warning the disruptive. In fact, I've called it a, a, another word. Write this one down. Rebuke. Rebuke. It's not a word we like. It's a word we tend to resist. If you're a non-confrontational person, you don't like the word rebuke or rebuff or reproof. They're all the same basic meaning. When you rebuke someone, you are warning them. You are saying, the road you're on, the path you're taking, the direction you're headed is disastrous. Get off the road. Go a different way. Sometimes you say it from the standpoint of, I've been down that road. I know where that road leads. Let me warn you, this is the end of that road. Change. Sometimes it's not because you've been on that road, but you've seen others. And sometimes it's just because it's in God's word. <laughs> Let me warn you, based upon God's word, this is not a good path. You don't have to experience One, one person said, it's, it's a wise thing to learn from your mistakes. Well, Proverbs says it's a wiser thing to learn from someone else's mistakes, right? We don't have to go through every calamity in order for us to sense this is a bad road. This is an evil di uh, direction. Let's warn these brothers and sisters in this way. He says rebuke, admonish. In fact, one version says admonish the unruly. Admonish the unruly. One version says the undisciplined. This one I like. It says the disruptive. The disruptive. See, what was happening in Thessalonica was there were some people that were confused about the second coming of Jesus. They were confused, so they were kind of like kicking back and saying, well, if Jesus is coming back, why would we invest ourselves in this job? If Jesus is coming back, our next paycheck's not going to be much use to us because we'll be out of here. So we'll just become idle. We'll become inactive. And the Apostle Paul is saying, no, wait, 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 don't do that. <laughs> it's that no worky, no ed. <laughs> 
let a man, if he doesn't work, not eat? Why does he say that? He says that because he is warning those who are idle. Not a good plan. Okay? Now, it doesn't mean that we're supposed to just work our heads off. We're not supposed to be um, undisciplined in our work. But he says, don't be idle. I've given you a job. I've given you work. I've given you something to do to accomplish for the kingdom and for your own life. Be engaged in life. Now, sometimes... We don't warn people because we don't want to call things sin. In fact, uh, you guys might know this one. This is uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. I love this verse. This is so good. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any sin, circle the word sin. (laughs) Circle the word sin there because that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about opinions We're not talking about differentiation in opinions and political stances and those kind of things. What we're talking about here is sin. When you see someone in sin, don't allow it to go on undiscussed, unshared, unconfronted. He says, warn them, warn them. Danger, Will Rogers. (laughs) Warn them, warning Caught in any sin. Now, sometimes we don't want to call something a sin. Like we'll see somebody, we'll see, I've had this happen. A husband um, just being cross and unloving to his wife on a regular basis around here. It's like, well, that's just the way they behave to each other. They've been married for a long time. And this, wait a minute. The Bible says husbands are to treat their wives this way like Christ. We need to talk to that man. We need to go to him and warn him that this is not a healthy way to grow. And it's not a good example and model for the body. What happens when you confront? There's repentance. There's change. There's blessing. There's someone who comes back 10 years later and says, my marriage is so much healthier because of the confrontation that you and the elders did. It's like, that's the result we're looking for. That's what we want to have happen is warning those who are caught in a sin. Because you get caught in something. And, and, and it's, like, it's like the whirlpool going down the drain. You're caught in a sin and you're getting sucked in. And you need somebody to come along and say, I want to warn you. This is not a good direction. This is not helpful. Instead, <laughs> let's go a different direction. You might just say, well... That person is just a passionate person. They just say what's on their mind. Well, sometimes you need to not say what's on your mind. Sometimes saying what's on your mind is cruel. Sometimes it's unloving, and it needs to be warned against because damage is done. Well, they're just sharing prayer requests. It's really not gossip. No, if it's gossip, call it gossip. Gossip is one of those things listed alongside of rape and murder. You go, whoa, whoa. He takes that very seriously. Yeah, when you kill a relationship through gossip, it's as bad as killing a person's body. We're serious. That's when you're caught in any sin. Don't mislabel or comfort each other by thinking that sin's not sin or by trying to relabel it. If someone's caught in a sin, restore that person. Look at the goal there. You're not trying to confront them to put them down. You're not trying to confront them to harm them. What you want to do is restore them because this is the pits. This is restoration. The goal is never to hurt someone. If if your goal is to hurt someone, you need to repent. You need to be warned. But if your goal is to love, to help, to build up, to encourage, think of that word, admonish, come on, you can do it. What's it say? Restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Oh, brothers and sisters, that's telling us right there how to do it. Not just to do it, but do it with a spirit and a heart and a desire for, with gentleness. Say, I want to treat them with kid gloves because I love them so much. Allow gentleness to be expressed. A spirit of gentleness. Underline that. So good. 
Now, what's the key, the last phrase on this? Keep watch on yourself. Why? Lest you too be tempted. I mean, you might even be tempted with saying, pride, I don't have that problem. Yeah, but you might have a ton of other problems. You know, he says, watch your own soul. Look to yourself. When you go to them, even say, I am not a perfect person. I got my own problems, but I want to talk to you about something that I care for you about. Something that is harmful to the family, to the body, and to your life. Now, I don't have it listed, but Matthew 18, you know the principle where he says, don't bring something up to the group. Go individually, one-on-one. 90% of what we deal with in relationships, need to be dealt with one-on-one. If they won't hear you, you want to take another brother with you. That changes the quotient from 90% to 99% of all things are done when you get two people talking together with someone. If they still won't hear you, you can take it to the next level. But it's rare. It's extremely rare that that's needed. Because you watch yourself. And you watch God work. Now let me read this uh, situation in Thessalonica. This is from Thessalonians. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle. Notice that word? And disruptive. That's the exact same phrase, exact same word that we're looking at in our passage today. Stay away from. He's saying keep away from them if he does not live according to the teaching we, you received from us. For you yourselves know that how you ought to follow our example. There always need to be biblical models and examples that you can point to. That's how people learn. They learn from others in the body. That's why we're taking this so seriously. In this case, it was the apostles' example. They were not idle. They were not slothful. They were not loathsome. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring. Remember we talked last week about laboring and leading and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that someone among you are idle and disruptive. There it is again. Same exact phrase. They are not busy. What's it say? They're busy bodies. Such people we command and urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to settle down and earn the food that they eat. As for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. Take special note of anyone who does not obey our instruction in this letter. Do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed. Yet, do not regard them as the enemy, but warn them. Warn them. What's the word we're talking about here? Warning them. Warn them as you would a fellow believer. So here's the delicate dance we have to do. We don't want to be busybodies meddling in other people's lives, but we want to be diagnosticians. We want to be uh, analytical and look in other people's lives and ask God, how do you want me to help them. In some cases, it's just like Paul's doing here, it's warning them. We don't want to be busy bodies involving ourselves in things we're not invited into, but neither do we want to be neglectful brothers, neglectful sisters. We want to be so loving that we step over what would maybe be normal bounds in our culture, because our culture is hands off, distanced, don't get close to me, I don't want anyone to know my business. That's our culture. Biblical Christianity is the opposite of that. I'm joining with the family of God, other people that love me, other people I love, and we're going to get in each other's business. Not to be busy bodies, but to be loving brothers. Are you catching that? Fellow believers. Warning one another is part of being a brother, part of being a sister. So two things have to happen. One, we have to be willing to get close enough. And I'm looking around saying some of us need to step that up. We need to draw closer to each other. 
Sunday mornings don't produce that. As much as we love Sunday mornings, you know me, we love Sunday mornings. Sunday mornings do not produce the level of engagement, the level of intimacy that we need for this. Second thing is, when you see something, be willing to take godly steps, godly action. So getting closer and being courageous. That's what this rebuke, warning the idle and disruptive is all about. I mentioned earlier, remember it's not just the leaders, it's the brothers and sisters. If you consider yourself a brother in Christ, if you consider yourself a sister in the Lord, this is the call. (laughs) It says, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Is that a good proverb? Can I I do one more? I love this one. I don't want to take too long on this because you've heard me probably before, but notice all scripture When you warn someone, don't say, well, my opinion is, who cares? What you want to do is bring God's word to bear on it. If it's not spoken to in God's word, leave it out. In opinions, liberty. In essentials, unity. Where God speaks, we want to speak. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable. We say beneficial. It's good. What's it good for? Number one, for teaching. So when you've got a baby believer, when you know a brother or sister that's new in Christ, what Ryan's doing right now in the class, it's just teaching God's word. God's word is good for teaching. But what happens when a person takes a veer from the teaching? Well, that's the next thing. Reproof. You not only go to God's word and say, here's the teaching where we're supposed to go. Here's the reproof to say, you're off track. You're off track. You need to get back on track. In fact, that's the next one for correction. Okay, I'm going to get back on track. God's word is good for teaching. God's word is good for rebuke. And God's word is good for correction. What's the last one? And for training. I'm back on the trail. I'm back on the road. Back the way the teaching goes. So it's good for teaching. It's good for rebuke. It's good for correction and it's good for training. So God's word is the answer to all of our questions about rebuke. Warning the idol comes through scriptural teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. He says that the man of God may be competent. One version says complete, equipped for every good work. That's our goal for each other. That's our hope. That's our desire, is that everybody in the body of Christ would be Competent, complete, equipped for every good work. I'm taking way too long on this. I apologize for that. But God's got some good things for us there. Can we go to the second one? Does that sound good? The second one is reassure people. So you rebuke some that need a warning. The second category, the second category are the disheartened. Who is it that needs encouragement? That's what we're talking about here. Reassuring. Oh, what a great word. When you assure someone of God's love, it builds them up. It produces courage in them. Brothers and sisters, we need to be a body that's reassuring one another. Reassuring about God's character, about God's love, about God's sacrifice, and about God's calling in your lives. We need to be reassuring God's got this. Don't say, you got this. Say, God's got this. Reassure, because that's where encouragement comes from. One of the versions says, comforting the feeble-minded. Okay, that's the same word as disheartened. I don't, I don't know if I like it as much, because we tend to think feeble-minded is like, you know, retarded or something. That's not the word. It's disheartened. It's discouraged those that are in need. He says, comforting and encouraging the faint, one version says, faint-hearted. When your heart faints, when a body faints, we know what happens. They have a seizure or they, they, they collapse. What happens when your heart collapses? 
Just like your body might need the paddles, you know, might need the defibrillation, your heart needs defibrillizing. How do you do that? Well, by encouragement. Encouragement are the paddles. <laughs> Paul says in Timothy, I mean in Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, for you know that we dealt with each of you, circle that, It's individualized, the very thing we're talking about today. One size doesn't fit all. You have to tailor make the approach to where the person is at. We dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. I mentioned that earlier. That's how kind of how we started this morning. Every parent knows their kid. They know them well enough to know, how do I need to adapt my parenting for this child or this child or this child? Don't parent the same way because children are not the same. Don't, I mean, do like Paul did. Don't deal with each brother or sister the same way because each child in Christ, each person in the body is different. He says encouraging, that's the word right there, comforting and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and into his glory. So it's very, very personal. It's full of deep and abiding love, like a father, like a father loves his children. Do do, do you sense anybody in the body that you have that kind of love for? We say, well, that's the Apostle Paul. He could have that kind of love. He wants us to cultivate the kind of love for one another, the kind of love, especially for young believers, like a parent for his child, like a mother for her children, or a father for his kids. Be that intimate and loving. And notice the goal is maturity. Live lives worthy of God. Live lives worthy of God. And you apply God's word. In fact, later he says, that's what it was about, giving God's word. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as you are doing. This was so important to the Apostle Paul. So on Mondays at 9.30, a few of us gather to spend some time answering and, and, and asking God in prayer for the prayer requests that have come in on the weekend. I mean, it's times like this that we'll get, okay, there's people that are needing health prayers, people that are needing grieving prayers, people that are... And so at 9.30 on Monday mornings, we have a loving care prayer group. We pray. We list things on the board. Some of you maybe have seen that. We list people's names and say, this person asked for prayer here. This person asked for prayer. Here's an answer to prayer. Here's where God's really at work. We list them out. Sometimes it fills the whole board. Okay? We jot them down, and then we pray. We pray. Then we do something else. We say, how can we encourage that person? What can we do to send a card, make a phone call, email somebody, post it on Facebook? We don't care the means, but we're asking the question for just a small group, how can we do it? And I invite you, if you've got time on Mondays, join us for the loving care group. Be part of the team that says on a regular basis, We're going to love people all we can. We're going to spend time diving into each other's lives deep enough. We're not just going to say, yeah, I'll pray for that. Yeah, I'll pray for that. And then forget about it. We're going to actually try to take time every week to bathe in prayer. Now, the elders come Monday nights, and we pray for that same list. We pray for those same people. In fact, often the cards are still laying on the table (laughs) from Monday morning at 930, Monday night when the elders meet, and we, 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 we give a additional signature to those. Some of you have seen those. How many of you have seen those before? Some of you received them. Was it encouraging? Was it a blessing? Did it hit a time when maybe you were disheartened or needed a bit of encouragement, encouraging your life? That's our goal. So I'm just telling you a very practical way you can be involved. Now, some of you have work on those kind of days, and I'm not saying it fits for everybody, but it could fit for a lot more. 
than uh, it does. So I invite you to that because it's so important that each of us reassure and give encouragement. Remember the uh, (laughs) Matthew passage Jesus said, each day has enough trouble of its own, therefore don't worry. If we just tell each other that, we're encouraging each other. I like the uh, Joshua passage, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Look what he says, do not be afraid. I think every day we need to hear that from somebody in the culture we're in right now. Every day, somebody, another believer, a brother or sister in Christ needs to shout at us, don't be afraid. Be courageous. Keep your head up. God will work through you. Don't be down. Don't be discouraged for the Lord your God. He'll be with you wherever you go. What if we just pumped each other up? Would that pump you up? Say that with me, pump you up. What if we just did that with each other, not in some just humorous way, but seriously, I want you to have courage. As I look out, I know what some of you are facing. I know what our culture is doing to us. And oh, he's calling on us to be courageous like never before. Never in the history of the church have we had this kind of challenge. It's God's plan, and he needs our courageous confrontation. God will be with you wherever you go. When you follow him, no worries. No worries. Now, sometimes it's just going to be being present with people. I jotted this down. This is from uh, Joseph Bailey, who's passed away now, an author. He and his wife lost three sons in different uh, occasions in their life, different events where three of their boys were killed. So he knew grief. Well, he wrote about grief. He's a pastor, church leader. So he contrasts these two things. I thought it was powerful. He says, I was sitting torn by grief. Someone came and talked to me about God's dealings, of why it happened, of hope beyond the grave. He talked constantly. He said things I knew were true. I was unmoved, except I wished he'd go away. He did. He finally did. Another came, here's the contrast, and sat beside me. He didn't talk. He didn't ask leading questions. He just sat beside me for an hour and more, listened when I said something, answered briefly, prayed simply, and left. I was moved. I was comforted. I hated to see him go. Sometimes the ministry of presence is what we do to encourage. Sometimes it needs to be verbal. It needs to be words. But sometimes we just need to hold one another's hands and be together in the pain. It's a hard thing. When I'm with someone who's grieving, I want to keep keep talking about hope and keep... Sometimes you just got to relax and be present and reassure them by your presence not your words. Now, if it's God's word, always feel free to interject that. But you you see the illustration here where Joseph Bailey was coming from. So who can you find? Who is it in your... Sometimes it's not the first couple of weeks of someone passing away where they need comfort from grieving. Sometimes it's six months down the road. In bereavement, they actually... Go 13 months. You go, why would they go 13 months? Well, in the 13 months after someone passes away, you cross every birthday, every anniversary, every holiday. 13 months, you're in a different spot 13 months down the road. But the toughest months are 6 through 13. Because the people have all kind of said, well, they're fine, they're fine, they're fine. There's no longer any meals being brought. 
There's no longer any love being shown in some external kinds of ways. What if you and I tune in to the people who are 6 to 13 months? What if we look around in the body of Christ and say, that person needs some encouragement right now in the body? Well, I'm taking way too long on that one too. Sorry about that. Let's do the third one. Can we do the third one? Oh, this one applies to everybody here. Everybody here can look around and see who needs help. Help! (laughs) Shout that out with me. Help! He says, help the weak. You know, I call it reinforce. Pour uh, resources into someone who needs help. Now, there might be resources of time. There might be resources of energy. There might be resources of finances. There might be a physical, you know, we need to help move a refrigerator. I mean, there's all kinds of ways we can help the weak, and we need to. Acts 20, verse 35. Do not forget the one thing, dear brothers, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. Did I skip that? I'm sorry, I was in the wrong one. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner that you would help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. You know, if you've got a person you're trying to help and they're a weak, let's say you're trying to help them swim and they're a weak swimmer. You don't just throw them in the deep end and say bye. You hang out with them. You stay close to them. <laughs> I mean, throwing them in the deep end might be a good thing to start with, you know, to let them learn how, but you stay close enough to help in case that is needed. The scriptural idea is um, that of mending the net. When a net breaks, you have to take time and mend it because what happens if you fish with a broken net? It's useless. The fish all fall through. You want to have mended nets. And that's, that's our job. We are fishers of men, and our main job is to help people mend their nets. That's the word for equipping in the New Testament. It's the word that leaders are to equip the body. We're to help each other mend the nets. We all have broken nets. We all have times and, and, and aspects that we need to see healed and broken. Listen to what uh, this verse says. Strengthen the feeble hands. <laughs> we said earlier, feeble-minded. <laughs> this is feeble-handed. Okay, Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. You know, if someone is quivering and their knees are shaking and they're not having very much strength, strengthen them. Remember when the uh, leader would have his hands up and the battle would go well, but his hands were... <laughs> it was hard to hold them up, and so he had some help holding up his hands because the battle would succeed with help. What a great picture. No man is an island unto himself. Nobody has the control of the um, success. It takes a body. It takes a family. It takes brothers and sisters to put their love together, to strengthen the feeble hands and steady the knees that give way. Say to those who have fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. The Lord will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come and save you. See, I love this fact that Paul didn't condemn weak people. Paul just said, you need to help weak people. Weakness isn't an opportunity for us to put people down. Weakness is for an opportunity for us to come alongside, to come beside and to help reinforce in their lives. Now, we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses. Circle, that's the word right there, of those without strength. And not just please ourselves. Oh, if there was a message the body of Christ needed in today's church, today's American church, is bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. What do you call that? 
I call it a consumer mindset. What's in it for me? Am I going to get something out of this? I want to please myself. What if your main purpose for coming to church had nothing to do with what you got out of it? What if your entire focus was helping somebody else, bearing up somebody else? I guarantee you'll get far more than if you say, what's in it for me? You'll get far more blessing and feeding as you engage at that level. Not just please ourselves. Each of us to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. What if when you left, you didn't say, oh yeah, it was a good sermon. Yeah, this guy spoke to me. <sighs> what if you looked at some, and when you left with the message, I was able to provide love and care and help to the weak today. Oh my gosh, far different. Our gatherings, our small groups, our our. our Every aspect of ministry around here would be radically different. For even Christ didn't please himself. He laid his life down. He gave himself up. The Christ-like example is to reinforce and to help the weak. A couple other quick scriptures. He says, clothe yourselves with compassion and put on love. The definition of love, helping the weak, fits right in there. One last one is Zechariah. The Lord Almighty said, Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. Sounds like immigration right there. The foreigner... Or the poor. Well, let's take the last one. Now, this is the one that is a little bit more of an umbrella because he says, be patient with who? So you've got warning the idle and the disruptive, right? It's a specific kind and type of person. You've got encourage the disheartened. It's a specific stage of a person's. You've got the idea of helping the weak, in this case, what have we got? Patience with everyone. Be patient with all. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord. A day is as a thousand years. That's what I was reading a minute ago. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing any would perish, but everyone would come to repentance. You see, God's a patient God. Aren't you glad? The whole reason he hasn't come back yet is because he's waiting for people to come to him. He's waiting for people to receive his son, Jesus Christ, as their Lord and the Savior. He's not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you and with me, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Because he's patient, we get called on to be patient. Jesus said, <laughs> you don't realize what I'm doing now, but later you will know. It takes patience. Wait for the Lord. Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Well, seven times. Jesus said, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. I mentioned earlier what kids do, what children do. Everyone is different. Well, every parent knows their young children. You got to have patience to see them raised. You got to have patience when you're changing diapers, right? <laughs> yeah. And as believers in the church, there's a lot of baby believers, a lot of young Christians, and it feels like you're changing diapers. You know, they're not potty trained yet. You know, so you've got to learn to be patient. It takes time. So with each of these situations, if you're rebuking the idol, then you, then you wait. You see the, if the warning works, if the warning helps, you've got to learn to be patient. Instead, if you are uh, encouraging the disheartened, you encourage them, and then you wait on God to work through that situation. If you're helping the weak, 
You wait, because you don't want to just make a crutch for someone that they're dependent on you in their weakness. If someone keeps coming to you year after year, day after day, oh, I'm so weak, I'm so weak, I'm so weak, maybe they need to be in that category of warned instead of helped, okay? But you got to be patient. You got to see where they're at and watch their circumstances change. Like the Apostle James said, man's anger does not achieve God's righteous person, uh, uh, God's righteous purposes, because love is patient and love is kind. Put on a heart of compassion. Let me uh, review these with you. Rebuke, warn the idle and the disruptive. Reassure, that means to encourage the disheartened. Reassure, that means to encourage, you know, help the weak. And then be patient with all. little test for you there. <laughs> so let me ask you this as we close. Who is it that God's calling you to implement one of these four approaches to? You know, get, get very specific. Is there someone in your life? It could be a very close spouse, family member. But I'm, I'm encouraging you to look into the body here, into the church family, into your small group, into your youth group, into your ladies group, into uh, any one of the areas where you're dealing with the body and ask yourself the question, what is God calling me to do? Does he want me to use me? Does he want to use me? in a warning and rebuke? Does he want to use me in an encouragement? You know? Does he want to help me with, does he want to use me in helping someone? Does he calling me to be patient? Yes, with all. Let's stand together and pray. Lord, you're so good to us. Thank you for seeing us as individuals and just loving us so deeply, so well. Thank you for not berating us when we're not growing like we should, but calling us over and over again to grow in Christ. Would you help us with this discernment today, Lord? Show us the, the people that you want us to dive into their lives, to, to love them closer, love them deeper, love them longer and love them in ways you've called us to today. Would you use these four aspects of lives to uh, enrich the church family here? Lord, we have so much to do. You've given us such a great mission. You've given us so many resources, and most of all, the love of Jesus in our lives. Would you help us to be an effective, loving family? Would you use us to love people to Christ? Love people to Jesus more and more, all the time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.